So welcome everybody for today's talk on Buddha's birthday and the mind and its divisions or very differentiation and how we can deal with that. I think Buddha's birthday is the easiest part, or at least seems to be. 2,500 years ago or so, uh, there was a prince called Shakyamuni Buddha, and now you expect me to say facts of his life. I won't. All of you know that. Why do we still celebrate his birthday? I think the most important part that he did in his lifetime, that he turned his energy inwards and asked very important questions, and he found the answer by experience, not simply by knowledge. In the Orient, experience precedes knowledge. In the West, we try to derive experience from knowledge. I know this is a generalization, but still the two cultures can be differentiated by this very much. So the Buddha and the patriarchs and many monks and nuns and lay practitioners afterwards, they attained something. Only they experienced it, but their practice and teaching guide us on our way. So the Buddha's life, the Buddha's work, the Buddha's great effort and courage remind us that we can do the same. The meaning of his birthday is that we can all wake up. We all have this Buddha nature, this kind of capability that we would wake up, leave our illusions behind and become clear, selfless and helpful for all beings. It seems that in the Orient we deal with the subject very much, with the self, and in the West we deal with objects very much, like a lot of science, a lot of material views, etc. What can we do with the Oriental teaching? First of all, we can understand it. No matter how well we seem to understand it, we still would have to practice it so as to have some experience which can help us as well as others. In the West, we are taught first to read, to understand, and one four goes into beliefs, that's religion, and the other goes into research, that's science. And the two do not seem to meet. To the present day, there's a very big division between religious views and scientific views in the West, although some people try to match them, to harmonize them, still the foundations are different. I remember very well my late father and my late uncle. One of them was a top-notch scientist and the other was a priest. And they used to talk. And I was a kid and I listened to them. And they treated each other with full respect and friendship. We helped each other out, family level. And at the end of each conversation, they said, well, you believe, I don't believe or I believe, you don't believe. And that's how the conversations ended, and I was left there with a the question, who's right here? And as kids, we have to know right from wrong. We have to see who is correct and who is incorrect. And I couldn't decide. I loved both of them. I loved my father, I loved my uncle. So somehow my path seems to go beyond the divisions of science and religion, and led me to the Orient, where the two, until recently, were not treated under different headers. Under the Buddha's teaching, the karma and the dharma, they form something complete. The transcendental and the worldly, they are under the same header. Something that you can experience with your senses and your intellect fit neatly into the transcendental realm. And this is something that we should treasure. Korea is unique in many ways, not just because Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism form a very important historical evolution. Since the Shila dynasty, the three have been developing together, sometimes one being stronger, like Confucianism in the Yi dynasty, sometimes Buddhism being stronger, like in the Shila dynasty. But history aside, what's most important that these traditions, especially Buddhism and Taoism, teach us to direct this question inside, what am I? 
or what is this? When the Buddha decided not to be a king, but rather an ascetic, he did pretty much the same thing. He turned his energy inwards and said, what is it that would become a king? So what is it that inside could be a scientist or a priest? And now he's a monk. What is that? And that search is never over. Even if you found it, you can help others find it. Why is it so important? Because as long as we live in illusions, as long as we are in a dream and don't wake up, we make bad decisions. How do we know that these decisions are bad? They cause suffering. They cause bondage. They cause torment. They cause things we don't want, and yet we make those decisions. How? Why? And the answer is, if we establish our lives on illusions, we do not get the desired outcome. We cannot follow our chosen direction. Something interferes, someone interferes. How does that happen, and why? We don't know ourselves sufficiently. And if we take our ego for our true self, that's the biggest mistake we can make. The distance between illusion and reality can be measured by how self-absorbed we are, how much we think we are special, how much we believe the laws do not apply to us. And if we are totally rid of any illusions concerning ourselves, then we know ourselves sufficiently so that we could understand each other's minds. What you don't see in yourself, you cannot see in the other either. So that's why meditation and the practice of this great question called, what is this, in Korean, Hwadu, is so important. Hwadu practice has many tastes. If you listen to many teachers, you can see the variations. I talk about two stages at this point. One is the verbal stage. When you begin, you have to repeat, like every breath or every other breath, what is this? It's like bringing the mind back to the moment. And when you do that, you leave your karma behind. You leave your dream world behind. And then, after a while, should that be half a year, one year, two years, the mind does it even without saying so. So the second stage is the huadu without words. How does that happen? I give you a metaphor. You can say to the taxi driver, go straight, go straight, go straight, or you can do this. And the taxi driver would understand both. Why is this necessary? This is linked very closely to our second topic, which is the entropy of the mind. When we ask, what is this? We refer to the source where everything comes from, where all phenomena come from, where we also come from as a notion, as a human being. If we don't do that, we cannot return to the one. We stay in the many. And now I would like to talk about how this many comes about. Everybody knows a prism. If you put light through prism, it becomes the colors of the rainbow. Likewise, when we are born, we put our energy through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, so that we have sight, smell, taste, sound, etc., etc. That's how our mind and energy become the colors of the rainbow, the five senses, and various faculties of thinking. All of this is natural, because otherwise, how would we be human? How would we live? So it's necessary for this basic entropy to appear. But as you read in the Heart Sutra, in the state of transcendental wisdom, there is no such thing. All forms return to emptiness, or the 10,000 dharmas return to the one. That's when the many colors of the rainbow become the light again. That's when the other prism appears and turns back everything to its original state, to the unborn and undying. One of the biggest tasks for us as human beings is, is to experience that. Why? 
The Sutra tells you about that too. If we believe that it's only the colors of the rainbow that exist, we are afraid of death. We are afraid that one day this would stop and we as human beings would just disappear, become something ugly or nothing or go to hell or heaven. If we live in these dream worlds, we have not become one. Our multiplicity controls us. The colors of the rainbow is all there is for us. And we haven't experienced the undifferentiated mind as we have it originally, in its original nature. The sixth patriarch had a very, very interesting and tumultuous life. At some point when he was pursued by He Myung, who wanted to claim the Buddha's relics and thus become the sixth patriarch, eventually caught up with him. And when the sixth patriarch was caught, he puts the relics on the rock, waits for He Myung, and asks him, the question, when you don't think of good and bad, what is your original face? Hame Young heard that question and got enlightenment. Suddenly, all his zeros and ones, all his good and bad, all his patriarch and not patriarch, me and not me, all this entropy returned to the one. And when this one mind disappears, then you wake up. Yes, you heard it right. This one mind also has to disappear. And then you're there. So our capacity as human beings is infinite to make more entropy, to make things even more in disorder. Or look at the source of everything and transcend all phenomena and transcend our own chaos and return to something not orderly or disorderly, but something natural. That's where Taoism is very useful. It talks about our true nature or the great way, not just enlightenment or awakening. Many people in the West believe that enlightenment is a bunch of photons hitting your brain. And you know that this is not true. Enlightenment is not about photons. Enlightenment is awakening from your dreams or illusions. So when that happens, Everything becomes natural. As the Buddha taught it, as it is. In Sanskrit, tathata, or Buddha tathata, things as they are. So this glass is neither good nor bad, neither small nor big. It's just like this. Water, the same. So the last three lines of the Heart Sutra teach us that precisely. Gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhiswaha. Literally, gate means go through. Go through the gate, become Buddha. So this gate is when everything becomes one, when everything returns to its original nature. This gate is when you don't think of good and bad, zero and one, me and the rest. And the world becomes just like this. And you don't lose anything except your own illusions and based on your illusions, your greed and anger and ignorance. That's all there is to lose. And like I said earlier, the notion of self is a distinct special entity. This is the biggest illusion that we can lose. You don't lose yourself. Only the illusion of your ego. It's very different. So if you say you have an I, it's a mistake. If you say you have no I, also a mistake, because then who is looking at me? Who is listening? Who is thinking? Who is responsible for your own actions and speech and thoughts and emotions? Who is it? So if you say this is an I, it's a mistake. If you say this is no I, also a mistake. So who are you? That's why we celebrate Buddha's birthday. So if you have any questions relating to entropy, mind, Buddha, you're certainly welcome to ask. There can be many reasons for this silence. One is that 
initially you, don't, you didn't understand what is entropy. Entropy is things in natural disorder, okay? So suppose you open a gas tank here and the gas comes out. In this space, it will distribute totally evenly. Even temperature, even density, even amount of gas particles everywhere. This natural tendency is called entropy. Or when you're in a hotel room, you open your bag and you fill the hotel room evenly with your stuff, making a natural mess. That's also human or personal entropy. And what is it that keeps it really together? It's your sense of order. So some people call entropy disorder or chaos. Some people call order cosmos. But this cosmos is a big bunch of entropy. It's just like as we are expanding, it's a natural tendency to fill all space and time. So how can we find order with this? How can we find order among all these phenomena? And the answer is, attain the moment. If you attain this moment, you find not only order, but you also find peace and insight. Those qualities that you are looking for, they are all at this moment. Neither in the past, nor in the present, nor in the future. Why? Diamond Sutra, the mind which is divided into past, present, and future, cannot get enlightenment. The mind which is not divided into past, present, and future naturally stays at this moment. We notice the three dimensions of space very easy. But how do we notice this one dimension of time? Well, we use watches and clocks and mobile telephones to show us how we choose to measure it. But suppose all the clocks would disappear, all these devices that measure time would disappear, how would you notice that it passes? Well, day and night, and your bathroom mirror, because your face would show you the passage of time, whether you measured it or not. And for eons, we didn't have watches, just the sun and sundials and the stars in the sky and the rotation of the planets and stars, and that's how we measured it, because we wanted to know how much time we have. So the cycle of birth and death is also an entropy, an expansion, a differentiation of the mind, because we started to incarnate. Even the Buddha doesn't talk about it how. That start was never quite revealed, because that start didn't happen in the past. That start is taking place at this moment, always, all the time. We are regenerating our birth and death here and now. That's why if you look at the 16 unanswered questions by the Buddha, one of them is the beginning and end of the universe. He doesn't say whether the universe is finite or infinite, whether it's just gods that created it or we are creating it too. The Avatamsaka Sutra says, mind creates the universe. Whose mind? What kind of mind? Yours alone? Ours? Human beings? Humans and animals? All beings in the six realms of existence? All beings in the Buddha and Bodhisattva realm? Who? What kind of mind is it? It's the same question as in the West, if God created this universe, what is God or who? We come to the same point. And that's where Christian mystics shake hands with meditation monks and nuns. Because if you turn this question inside, if you turn the energy inside, if you don't follow your differentiation, your entropy, your chaos outside, you find the answer. It's not somewhere in time and space. It's not somewhere in the sense realms. It's not somewhere where you could grab it, put it into a box and sell it at an auction. So that's why it's good to remember the Buddha's birthday. That's why it's good to turn the energy inwards, 
ask this basic question, this fundamental and clear question, and return to a mind which is clear like space, clear like a mirror. That's our treasure, our true treasure, which we can rely on for many, many lifetimes. Why? Practice creates habits. Even without practice, you can create a lot of habits, but practice creates the habits of awakening. The sixth patriarch, when he was 17 years old, he heard one sentence on the marketplace, which was from the Diamond Sutra, and he got enlightenment right away, full. He immediately asked the monk, Elder brother, where is this monastery where you are from? And then he was escorted to the fifth patriarch's place. But it was also said, and it's oral tradition, that the sixth patriarch was practicing 80 lifetimes before he could attain that. That's something not many people would know. So practice creates habits. How come he woke up so quick? Why did the Buddha have to practice for six years? Why did Zen Master Joju become Zen Master when he was 60 years old, abbot when he was 80, and he was living 120 years? Why are there so different time spans and experiences of awakening? Why? Because of previous habits and previous lives. So either you set yourself on a course of awakening and make habits to support that, or you don't. It's that simple. And moment to moment, the decision is yours. Do you become more attached, more identified, more dualistic, more entropical, more delusional? Then you get further and further and further. Or do you make decisions to become clear, not to identify, not to make I, take freedom and responsibility under the same header, clearly perceive cause and effect, selflessly helping other people, and when that happens, you get closer and closer and closer. These habits can be and will be with you for lifetimes, whether you see them or not, okay? That's why these decisions are so important. They affect not only you, they affect your beloved, your enemies, your whole world. And if you look at this world as the common output of seven billion people's karma, the current results are not really encouraging. We have some serious cleanup to do. If we don't do this soon enough, circumstances on this earth will become way worse than before. And unlike many other news, I can tell you that the world is not going to end. Why? Because we didn't begin this. If we started this as creators of this earth, yes, we could end it, but we can't. We started to incarnate here as human beings, and we don't see our situations for several millennia. We have all these ideas who we are or supposed to be, but we don't really see who we are, what we are doing on this planet, and what our true job should be. That's why we are wrecking it. That's why we are killing each other. That's why we make wars. That's why we deplete our resources. Because we do not recognize who we are, why we are here, and what we should do. And we have a lot of time. We have our free will. We have our time and space to move, to create karma or take away. We have all the possibilities. How do we use them? What do we become? And that question is decided by you, by the answer to this, what is this? Or who am I? Or what this decision will turn me into? What do I become by this decision? In speech? In action, in thought, in emotions. What do I become? Who do I become? So moment to moment we have a chance. Moment to moment we have a decision to make. And that's why the teaching goes like this. Whether sitting, standing, talking, 
silent, lying down, dreaming, or in a wakeful state, constantly, without interruption, what is this? And when this question goes without question, without words, then your mind is clear, 100%. Any questions? The, the more I try to still my mind, the more it becomes, as you already said it, very, you know, these days I have a very, very I, have, I have small small amount of time to talk to people. It's maybe 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes in 24 hours. Uh, I keep myself quiet. I don't talk. I don't, I don't like to talk with people. So, but in, inside, <laughs> that's a lot. Uh, and it, the, the more I try to steal it, the more it's tricky me. You know, I, I think too much. Okay. So, I have a question for you. <laughs> okay. Can you put out fire with gasoline? No. <laughs> Can you put out thinking with thinking? <laughs> so if you have this experience, 10 out of 10, it's thinking, trying to control thinking. You can't. Mm. It's like you have a messy room and you blow up a hand grenade. It just gets worse. So inside, take one step back. This step back gives you distance, perception, even protection from your own noise, from your own karma. And you can do this by watching your breath. Watching your breath and focusing on your Tantian in Korean Tanjon is a very powerful practice. It's the physical and energetic part. But the mental part is really building up this mind space, establishing some internal distance but clear perception. That's why the question is useful. So don't try to stop your thinking. Don't try to make this artificial peace. This artificial peace is the hotbed of an internal combustion, you know? this huge, you know, volcano coming out. So take a step back, redirect your energy to your tanjan, watch your breath, and then all this energy that kind of powers up your thinking and your heart returns to its original point, to this no differentiation point. Our human entropy or differentiation starts when this energy from the tantian starts to move up. In Korean, it's called sangi, rising energy. And when that happens, it becomes suppressed fear, middle burner, open emotions, upper burner or heart chakra, speech, throat chakra, thinking, it's the forehead, various sensory perceptions in the various senses. And if you're attached to that, you have this experience of total chaos. This world, you know, is becoming more and more zeros and ones, and more and more zeros and ones. 30 years ago, nobody had to warn people to turn off their mobile telephones. Guess why? They didn't have any. Now, everyone has one. I just saw a four-year-old talking over the phone. Not only that, she dialed it. It's different. So inside, with this question, take a step back. Or if you want, you can use a jinon or yombul or mantra. Anything just to, to return to the moment and attain the mind which has no attachment to any of its objects. That's why we say clear like space, clear like a mirror. And that distance is not ignorance, is not irresponsibility. It's just some space to perceive. Just like when you paint a picture, Sometimes even the best painter has to go back, sometimes three, four meters of a distance to look at the artwork, and then go back and continue painting. But we human beings, when we have a little problem, we not only do not step back, we put our face straight into the canvas. We call it suppression. We want to suppress the problem. You know, sometimes even roll in it a little bit. <laughs> so if you practice correctly, Soon this chaos will become less and less and less. 
your shock absorbers, you know, down here become stronger, 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 then you can endure the ups and downs of your karma. Vimalakirti called this the patient endurance of the uncreated. Now, don't try to just understand this because this understanding is not really possible without some practicing experience. Nearly all teaching, but especially Zen teaching or Kan Hua San, is designed with its stories, kongans, or even meditation instructions so that your experience is not complete without actually trying it, doing it, wrestling with it, or even suffering from it. In the West, we try to create perfect knowledge without any contradictions. And that's not really natural. Nature is full of contradictions. We humans are full of contradictions. These paradoxes actually nurture us and sustain us, like an electric engine would not turn without plus and minus. Okay, without having a lot of electrons and no electrons. And, you know, that's how power works. In the Orient, Zen masters design kongans in such a way that your mind would be prompted to come back to the moment, attain some intuitive faculties, and let go of this thinking, thus getting rid of this mess or chaos that you refer to. And at first, it gets worse. Just like you described, I'm trying to do this, and it's just messier and messier. Yeah, that's when your habits begin to scream. But if you do this practice right, as instructed, then this mind space becomes clear, your mind mirror becomes even and undistorted, and you can perceive this karma very well, not identify with it, take the energy out, and then when necessary, you can use it. I'm just wondering, since we're living in this kind of society where after this Dharma talk, people are going to get back into routine, they're going to go have a coffee with their friends or start work, whether it's, you know, being a policeman or a teacher or, or a variety of different things we do in everyday life. Um, is it possible to balance this kind of meditation and philosophy and practice of Buddhism in our everyday life that it is now? Because we are so, we identify ourselves by how, how we see ourselves in society. It's so strong that routine and time, as you say, structures our everyday work and habits that is it possible to perhaps balance the two? Or is it is it possible, one or the but other? it takes effort. Mm -hmm. What you refer to is what we call the habit force of yourself and society together. And uh, just like a good car, your mind needs maintenance. So we clean our bodies maybe several times a day. How often do you sit down and clean your mind? So it needs just maintenance. First, some good refuge in a correct teacher, correct teaching, and correct sangha or practicing community. And once that routing is done, then you just have to refuel or clear your mind, hopefully on a daily basis. It doesn't take long. Every day, like 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes in the evening. Altogether, if you do this for one hour, you're pretty much set, plus the retreats that you would embark on. But a car which you take to the car center in Korea, or a body which you take to the hospital if it gets sick is way less complex than this mind. So at first, at the beginning, it takes a little more work also. But once you are on track, you just need to be a good pilot. Good pilot has two major concerns. Navigation, propulsion. So what is the direction of your life and how much energy did you put into it? Both are important. Obviously, if any of them goes wrong, your life can crash, or run out of steam, or overburn, or hit the target, or miss the target. So have a very clear direction for your mind, and then strengthen your center, your shock absorbers, so that this clear mind would remain unmoving even when somebody has a bad opinion on you. Even when people hate you, you wouldn't hate them back. You would stay clear. You would stay spacious. 
And based on that oneness, you can still radiate some compassion towards them. The social image that you mention in your question can be a very powerful feedback because most of our lives we didn't know anything else than that self-image. It starts with our parents. You know, I noticed in Korea how non-judgmental parents are with their kids. In the West, it's very, very early when they say, you're good, you're bad, you're clever, you're stupid, this kind of stuff. In Korea, this doesn't happen, and this is very, very interesting. I tell you one of my first experiences uh, over 20 years ago when I went shopping, you know, uh, to Kyobo, Mungo. It has this huge bookstore with a stationary section. And there was a mother looking at ball pens and uh, paper clips and whatnot. And she had a four-year-old, max four or five. And imagine the little boy among these huge aisles, you know, up and down, looking. Mom is nowhere. And the little boy started to kind of use his belly power and scream, oh, ma, and walks. Doesn't cry, doesn't turn to people for help. Say, oh, ma. Walking, 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 walking. Oh, ma. And after one minute, he found her. The mom hugged him. No judgment. How could you lose me? N nothing. No nothing hysterical. And nobody from Kyobo Mungo, which is a busy place, interfered. And I was stunned. I've never seen anything like this. That tells you about clarity. This boy was super clear and nothing special. He just wasn't kind of tainted with any judgments, any false self-image, any kind of routines that would kind of take him off track because he saw some other example and would have followed that. He acted out of his own center, out of his own mind. And that was a fantastic experience. Sometimes you see them, and you can ask, how on earth do these innocent-looking kids with spontaneous and bright action and reaction become these atrocious adults that we are? Because we all become adults, and we all begin to develop problems, and we all begin to be who we do not want to be. And this little kid just threw me totally off. That was fantastic, okay? And uh, that's, how, that's how this self-image, before it happens, that's how you know, it works, okay? I hope this answers your question. Return to this child's mind. And since we cannot return to this child's mind without any practice, clean out the noise. Then the signal remained. What was so impressive about this kid, that he had no noise. No noise. One signal. Mom, mom, and mom. That was the signal. And then the radar worked. And after a minute, he found her. It was nothing short of amazing. The rest you know. Thanks for your uh, <clears throat> discourse today. I um, just have two questions. And, uh, one thing is, um, often we can see and read the Sutra, Buddha Sutra. And I just want to know the meaning. Uh, the Buddha... Uh, rele release the lightings, so-called bangwang, sometimes. So I, I do not want to, uh, 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 actually I do not know exactly what the meaning is Buddha always in a sutra. Uh, like we can understand as blessing, but however, this is un unclear to me yet uh, when I read the sutra. So. The, what the meaning is Buddha is release the lighting to, to the peoples or some, something like that. The Buddha releasing the light, you know, it's a phrase in the sutras, as you quote very well. And we don't have to do much with this phrase. All we need to do is really practice the Buddha's dharma, the Buddha's teaching, and then we attain this light. And this kind of attainment will help us. Trying to figure out conceptually what this means is not going to help you. Practice meditation, then you attain this light and become part of this mind stream. 
which started way before the Buddha. Shakyamuni talks about Buddhas before him and the Buddha of great love, Maitreya, after him. What's important is that there is a line of mind practitioners. Those practitioners that work on awakening. And if you join them by practicing any tradition, any school, if you devote yourself, you become part of this mind stream. This energy line, this lineage devoted towards awakening. And this is very, very different experience than just sitting somewhere in a hut. That's why refuge is important, teacher-student connection is important, student-student connection is important. I urge you not to use a dictionary because that doesn't give you the true meaning. The true meaning is coded in your experience. So strive for that experience and that will teach you, okay? And second question I have. Um, also, I want to know clearly about the Huegang Banjo, like you mentioned, concentrate in the, into me and withdraw any sensories from, from outside to intern, internal, the internal side. Then we can say some, some letter Huegang Banjo, so return to, to ourselves and or understanding, uh, showing the lighting to ourselves. So could you explain some clear about what the meaning is about the Huegang Banjo? Yeah, again, the final touch will be your initial experience of mind not going out, not going somewhere to West Coast America or Jeju-do, but staying in the moment. And I give you an example. And you can try that, and everyone can try that right here, right now. Open your ears and perceive what you hear. You can hear the sound of the ventilation system, right? Now, if we stay like this, meditating, staying with the sound for 10 minutes, the notion of this ventilation sound will not be continuous. It will be interrupted. It will be interrupted by your thoughts, your feelings, perceptions, impulses, and various forms of consciousness. Although the Heart Sutra says originally the five skandhas are empty, that is true if you don't have any karma. But if you have karma, then they are not empty because we are born. We have a body and a mind. We have feelings, perceptions, impulses, and consciousness. That's what makes us human. So turn your energy inside means stay in the moment, uninterrupted, uncontrolled by your karma. And you can see what happens. Try to focus on the sound when you get home, or try to focus on your question or your mantra inside. And you will see that your habits, mind habits, will break it. Then your practice habit will bring the mantra back or the sounds back. And over time, your practice habits can become stronger than your karma. Your mind can become stronger than your entropy. And then you attain the path. Whether it's gradual or sudden, it doesn't matter. Turning your energy inside means you do not focus on the mind object. You focus on the mind itself. Turn your energy inside. Keep it unmoving in your tanjon. Keep this moment clear. Return to the mind, which is clear like space, clear like, clear like a mirror. That's how it works. But as I said at the beginning of this answer, only your experience will teach you. These words cannot give you sufficient teaching. Actually, the reason why I came today to Sinim, see the Sinim and, and is that maybe I like uh, so much about Master Sung San as, uh, personally. Mm. So I, ex I would like to ask you, actually, I didn't much experience with him. Uh, just I just recorded in a movie or some reading books we only don't know, etc. So I would like to ask you, any you have some experience or, or, or some impressive feeling from him in your some... Several, uh, but that doesn't help you. <laughs> your practice will help you. And I'm here to help your practice. If I tell you stories between Zen Master Sung San and me or other students and Zen Master, 
They are wonderful. But I would rather ask your direct questions of your situation and your practice because that's relevant. So we're not teaching fairy tales. We are answering people's questions. Okay? Good. Meditation uh, was created in India first. Oh, oh because meditation tradition is very, very strong in India. So why is it so in India, not other places? Well, Kanjani, to my limited knowledge, meditation was not just in India a long time ago, it was in Taoist China. Taoism is timeless. It's very old. The fact that the scriptures were diminished by um, the Yellow Emperor, Shi uh, Huangti, it doesn't mean that before him Taoism didn't exist. It's thousands of years old, just like the Vedic scriptures in India. And Personally, I see that every great civilization had some kind of mind practice or meditation behind it. And that is at least in two places on this planet, India and China. And later on it went to many other countries. Why did we start there? Why did they start to meditate, whereas in other continents until recently, maybe not so much? I think it's just human evolution the evolution of the mind. And this evolution has many stages. One stage is when we believe that the world uh, objectively exists, and we believe that the gods objectively exist, or invisible beings, and we try to control it. And that's how shamanism, in Korean, mudang, you know, was developed for thousands of years, trying to control an objectively existing world both visible and invisible. In India and China also, these layers of culture existed and exist the present day. But if you direct your question elsewhere, to the origin of this, to the origin of our mind, to the origin of our feelings and speech and thoughts and actions, and everything changes. And I think the major step in human evolution was that we started to deal with this question rather than trying to control or manipulate the world around us. You can see it in science many times. <clears throat> Some scientific people, they attain something deep inside and they don't know what it is. It just changes their priorities. And they turn to meditation, they turn to some insight, they really wish to attain something more than just scientific results. Religious people, same way. Sometimes religious orthodoxy or very, very dogmatic views, they become so stifling and so much binding that people want to be free from it and they start to ask questions and they go down the same road. The same road of directing the energy in words and experience something beyond scriptures. What is it that really makes Sonbulgyo into Sonbulgyo? Everybody in this room knows the four principles of Zen. One is, do not depend on the scriptures, directly pointing to human mind. Attain your true nature, that's what makes you Buddha. And transmission from mind to mind without any externals or ceremonies. So. These four principles actually make you go beyond all these paraphernalia, all the organized religion, all the scientific views, all the previous notions of uh, objectively existing uh, universe. And this is just human evolution, and probably we will not stop there. There can be a time when the Dharma disappears from this earth and gives place you know, to something else. I doubt it could disappear for a long time because we humans will always be interested where we come from, where we go, what happens when we die, what happens when we are born. These questions will never die. They can take many different shapes and forms, but the inquiry will always be there. So whether we meditate to solve this problem, read books to solve this problem, uh, use the internet to solve this problem, it's secondary. 
we will not rest before we get a good solution. I'm pretty sure of that. So as an individual, you can always say the search is over. But as the human race on this planet, we can never say the search is over. Why? Because the process of birth and death is not over either. So as long as we keep incarnating on this planet, we will have a question, in fact, a bunch of questions. Who are we? Why are we doing this? How can we change this? How can we attain something deeper than just the usual sensory phenomena, the usual entropy of our consciousness? So evolution never stops. And one big step in this evolution was that we turned our question inside and we started to look for answers from our own nature and we keep finding them. Kana Sompobun, Kana Sonuro, Kumban, Pangbobun, Heximi, Uishimul, Irikin, De, Dago, Algo, Inden, Deo, Uishim. Kunde Sungsang Sanim, Kesa Kalcho, Kajang, Chunguan, Tema, Junganaga, I just don't know. Kun Uishimul, Irikin, Gago, John, Pelge, Ipubun, Anin, Nika, Chegabukushi, Pungonen, yeah. 가나 선법으로 의심을 일으키는 공부 방법을 하셨는지 아니면 저스트 돈노라는 저는 그것이 약간의 가나 선법하고는 좀 다른 공부 방법으로 여겨지고 있는데요. Okay. I understood your question. And I can tell you that both in the west and in the east there are mistranslations where we do not quote Jesus or Buddha correctly or the patriarchs. The great doubt is the wrong word. It's not ushim, it's not doubt. It's chilmun, it's question. Doubt means I do not know whether I should drink or not. In the case of a doubt, there's duality, at least two things or people that I have to choose from. So I'm in doubt because I cannot choose. There are two objects or more objects and I cannot decide. This undecided mind is called doubt. But the great question has no object. How could there be doubt? So when you have this question directed inwards, there is no point or points to be doubtful about. You just ask the question and let go of every answer. You don't check the answers, you don't have doubts about the answers, you do not qualify the answers, you don't deal with them. Why? These answers all appear and disappear. And if it appears and disappears, then this is not what we are looking for. We are looking for something which doesn't appear and does not disappear. That's not doubt. You get there by the question. Why? The question acts like a magnet. It attracts back all your thoughts and emotions. All your karma of past, present, future return to the question. That's how you get clear and strong. So it's not ushim. It's not doubt. It's a question which attracts back all karma and takes the energy out, takes the information out. Then your karma disappears because your karma is energy and information combined. And once this kind of fusion is gone, your karma is gone. It's important if anybody in this room remembers any traumatic experience in your life, how did you get rid of it? First of all, you did not identify with it, number one. And then you could ask questions, where did this come from? Then you saw this whole line of cause and effect. And after you have seen that, that film stopped, that movie did not come again. Because you saw it, you put it to the right place, and then it disappeared. That's how it works. So if you keep the great question, then, since you're not attaching to anything that appears in your mind, you attain this don't know. This no thinking mind, not moving mind. That's when the words of the Huadu disappear, and the Huadu itself remains there. A mind which doesn't think, doesn't move. That's only don't know. There is no doubt. So keep the great questions, Sunim. Keep this wonderful practice. 
wait until the words of the question disappears, and then this don't know becomes very clear. Doubt means small, very small, zero or one, this or that. Great question means go beyond all that. Okay? Thank you very much. Wonderful question. Anything more? I think this is not the un, not a suitable question. This uh, great Dharma talk. That's why you should ask. Yes, but uh, my geologist and the oldest of one of friends' husband is, uh, is dying today or tomorrow. No, uh, nobody don't know. Nobody knows. My my husband, my friends of the husbands is dying. Maybe not not too late, not too long. He doesn't live by uh, cancer of end, end of cancer. So uh, what do I say to him and my, my, my friend? He's not, they are not the Buddhist and they, they don't have any religious. So what do I do? Well. I'm going to meet the, tomorrow. Yeah, them, you so. can say yes. that you do everything for the well-being of this person, yes. okay? Because they are not Buddhist, but you are. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting here. So you keep this Kwansan Bosan mantra yes. for him until or while he is in the body. Oh, yes. And when he departs, then change for Jijang Bosa. Yes. Because going through the gate of death is very difficult. Except for fully enlightened people, very, very difficult to leave this body because of our attachments and fears and all kinds of stuff. So you keep Kwan Sam Bosal for him. And you do not have to explain yourself to the relatives. You just say, I do everything for his well-being. And you don't have to make up any speech. Sometimes we want to be kind and we lie in the process. And it's felt right away. That's why one of the great precepts of the five precepts is do not lie, because if you do that too much, you are reborn as a bird. You see the connection? If your words do not connect to reality, they just fly away. They don't stick. They are too light because they are not relevant. They are not true. So in this case, many times, we want to make people feel good. We want, we want to make ourselves feel good. And we lie in the process. And we become irrelevant and ingenuine and unnatural at the same time. So your question is wonderful. What you should do is tell them the truth that they can take. They cannot take Buddhist religion because they are either not religious or they may have some other religion in some other cases. So tell them what you will actually do and radiate that compassion of Kwan Sam Bosal already to the dying person as well and to the bereft family as well. That's also very important. And keep that Kwan Sam Bosal mantra you can be at the bedside of the dying, maybe hold his hand, or just comfort him in various ways. And then this radiation of compassion and loving kindness will help him pass. And the moment that this happened, and it's confirmed, you change for Jijang Bosa. And Jijang Bosa is the guardian of our way. Our oaths and vows, and our way, they are connected. And if we don't speak the truth, Jijang Bosal will. So, in that sense, Jijang Bosal can really help the deceased. And you do this for 49 days, and after Sashib Kujia, stop. Why? After that, the Yonga, the soul, is on his own. 49 days. Every day or every seventh day, you can recite it. For important people, every seventh day, they make small ceremony. And Sashib Kujia, big ceremony, big chesa. Small chesa, sometimes every week. Why? Clean karma. Very important to clean the earthly plane. Many, many people, after they are dead, they cannot depart because they are still attached and they go into the dreams of their family, they visit places where they, all kinds of stuff. But they have to go. 
if they too much around around in this earthly plane, they lose energy. And it's not so good. So then you chant Jijang Bosa, then Jijang Bosa says to the Yonga, to the soul, come, you have to follow me. And you also from behind push. You have nothing to do. You're dead. Go on. Okay? All this with compassion and strength. So if you do that, then this will help. Help you help the family and help the deceased at the same time. So we can help each other whether we are alive or we are dead or one is alive and the other is not. All depends on your relationship with the person. How you form that relationship moment to moment. What you put into that relationship. In fact, this earthly existence, if you look at it very clearly, is a huge relationship training. And we haven't learned the lessons. For thousands of years, look at how we treat each other as human beings. How we relate to each other. What we do to each other. What we say to each other. What we think about each other and feel towards each other. This training, we haven't finished. Okay? So you can do a lot of good if you follow this, if you follow the Buddha's teaching. Okay? You're welcome. A long time I have, I have wondered, um, so 49 days, yeah? if one passes away, then when he get uh, embodied again? It depends on the karma of the person. 49 days is also not a fixed amount. If the soul is very developed, then passes very quickly. That's why for, for Zen masters, in the old days, they hit the chukpi three times, Bow three times, light incense, candle, then extinguish, finished. No chesa, no nothing, already gone. No attachment, so doesn't stay here. Also, various people with various karma, they have various amount of time that they spend here. So it is really important to see that about 49 days, one, two months, is the usual time that a normal Jung Seng or sentient being spends, but most of us are gone, fortunately, way before that. So, in most cultures, for three days, they didn't cremate the bodies or didn't even bury the bodies. For three days, they had various ceremonies, various uh, chesas, various things. Why? Because in three days, still anything can happen. It's not just in the West that Jesus resurrected after three days. In the Orient, sometimes people who were thought to be dead, they woke up the next day, okay? So it was not always certain, but after three days, definitely the soul doesn't return to the body, finished. So then how long does it take for us to really depart from the dimensions of the earth? And it completely depends on your karma and your mind. Your mind is very developed, not attached to your karma, quickly, boom, go. And in relation to that, how long does it take to be reborn again? Again, it depends completely on the mind and on the karma. How long does it take, you know, to prepare for the next birth? Some Zen master says, I'll see you in 500 years. Then you know, he's not coming back anytime soon. And these people, they were not joking. Practitioners who do sometimes very hard life on this planet, not everyone but some, they really finish a lot of karma here. So maybe they're not reborn right away. Maybe only in 500 years. So which one is better? So reborn soon or reborn late, long late? Do you like your life? So, so. <laughs> yeah. So Good. you will be so reborn far. Good soon. So, far. so you will be reborn soon, to repeat it. Okay. Then next, next question. Or the awakened said, See, they would not be reborn. See, they will, yeah, why? Teaching words are important, but we actually don't know whether they were reborn or not. They motivate a lot of people by the truth, but this truth is not the experience of the practitioners yet. If you say, no returner, Okay, anagamin, no returner. That means completely went beyond any attachments, and that is possible for everybody. 
but they never reveal their plans. How and when they are reborn is their business. But to motivate us with the teaching, through the teaching, that's also their job. So they do that. But these teaching words are not to be confused with what they would be doing after they are gone, which we are not privy to. We are not aware of that. And we have nothing to do with that, basically. Those highly developed consciousnesses like Buddha, Christ, Lao Tzu, Sri Ramana, these people, they have their own path. And it's way above us. But we have the same Buddha nature. We have the same potential to attain enlightenment, which they attained to a much greater degree than we did. So we have to understand our situation. And their teaching motivates us to follow. But what they will do is their business. We don't know that. You, you didn't answer to my question. Of answer. course. Mm. I shouldn't. I gave you an answer which you need to know, not what you wanted to know. That's how it works. Sometimes I have to disappoint people, you know? Now I just did. So, um, um, uh, along the history, we saw many great uh, spiritual gurus and uh, yeah. teachers. So, they appeared in this world. So, yeah. it means that uh, the awakened in the past life, they are reborn. They were reborn to teach us, right? You say it means that. We don't know what they did. We don't know how many lifetimes they practiced, where they were born, how often, what kind of body, what kind of existence. We don't know. What we know that 2,550 something years ago, Buddha was born. About 2,015 or 22 years ago, Jesus was born. Last century, Sri Ramana was born, maybe end of 19th century. It's important to see what we truly know and what we presume to know. And this kind of foreknowledge doesn't really help us. Why I mentioned this during the Dharma talk? Because it's interesting. And it links to the hard task of getting down to business and meditate. It can motivate people without you know, making a mistake. But honestly, what they did before and what they do after, we have no idea. Unless they appear to you like Jesus appeared to the disciples after he died or Bodhidharma got out of the stone coffin and went back to India with his <laughs> sandal on his stick and the Chinese envoy, you know, met him and got his scripture. So that's a pretty good one. These are things we can think about and serve as a mo motivation. But our curiosity is never fully satisfied. Never. That's how life works. You have to ask several questions to yourself. What is it that you are here for? How do you help your fellow student? And if you go through this, then what you will be doing? And for us, the motivation to practice, uh, to follow Sung San Sunim's teaching, uh, to go on the path and not care about looking left or right, not to fall into doubt, but follow the great mind of don't know. So I hope that all of us will be joining hands and minds in this effort, practice together, attain awakening, and save all beings from suffering. Thank you very much for your attention today.